chapter 23. But it's a good book. Leviticus, uh, once you get the book, if you get the book, it's really a book about holiness. It's about holiness. So in chapter 23, which is a very interesting chapter, uh, if you want to entitle this chapter, it will be entitled God's Calendar. Chapter 23 of Leviticus will be entitled God's Calendar because we are actually going to go through the Jewish calendar and you will see the prophecies of Jesus. You will see how these, this calendar relate to Jesus Christ. Um, and I always tell people and our born again believers this. When, we're, when we study the Old Testament, remember this, uh, the Old Testament is relevant today. And you say, well, how so? How is the Old Testament relevant today? Uh, when we read the scripture, you, you'll get to it. You're going to read the scripture where it says that all scripture is given the word correction for reproof, right? For building up. So all scripture refers to all 66 books of the Bible. So we have to look at it all. Now, what do all the books of the Bible point to? Every book of the Bible points to Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, it, all of them point to Jesus Christ. So if somebody pulled up the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, what are you trying to find in there? You're trying to find Christ. And what, uh, how do those scriptures relate to Jesus Christ? We are now in the book of Leviticus. Now, just to let you know, in Sunday school, so what's going to happen in Sunday school starting this Sunday, I'm going to go back, because uh, we already done it at the previous church. We went through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus uh, already. But I'm going to go back to Genesis and Bible class, just when I teach. I'm not going to teach every Sunday, but the first two Sundays of every month, I will teach Sunday school. So I'll start, and I'm going to teach straight to the Bible, so I'm starting Genesis. So starting this Sunday, I will be in Genesis. Because we have already gone through. But in Bible class, we're going to start with this book, and then we're going to go from chapter 1 to Deuteronomy, and then all the way straight through the Old Testament. We're going to do it that way. So everybody can go verse by verse. So, chapter 23, I love this chapter. I'm glad I already went through it, so I, I can give you a whole lot more insight than when I went through it the first time. God's calendar. So, God is in control mm -hmm. of everything in history. That's the number one thing we need to understand about. God's calendar. He's in control of everything. There is nothing that is going on in this world today that God is not in control of. Amen. Nothing. Everybody's steps are ordered by God. Amen? Amen? So you know that the Israel Israelites had a weekly Sabbath. Now somebody tell me, and I, you know, I like to ask questions, so you can raise your hand. And if you don't understand anything, I am not preaching, I am teaching. That means you can raise your hand and stop me. Say, uh, Reverend, what you talking about? <laughs> Please stop me, because I can get on and I can go on the road, but I will I will stop if I see your hand if anybody has any questions. But please let your questions stay on the topic that we're talking about. Amen. Okay? So we can get some material. We only have we only have an hour to go over the material, so uh, let it pertain to the lesson. So let me ask you a question. I like, I like asking questions, and you can answer me, and then you can ask some questions too. When is the Sabbath day? When is the Sabbath day? It is, it's the day of rest, but what day is the day of rest? Saturday. Somebody said Saturday, right? So how come it's not Sunday? I think Saturday is Sunday. First day of the week. Also, oh, Sunday is the first day of the week. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Okay, that is totally correct. You are correct. Uh, some people uh, think that Sunday is the Sabbath day because we go to church every Sunday. But no, uh, Sunday is not the Sabbath day. Uh, Saturday is the Sabbath day. We have a whole denomination called the Seventh Day Adventist. We go to church on Saturday because they believe that we who go to church on Sunday are wrong. We go to church on Sunday. That's a whole other subject uh, to talk about one day. Uh, so yes, so God told the Israelites at this time in their history, because Jesus hadn't raised from the dead yet, that Saturday Sabbath was what a day of rest. That's in the Ten Commandments as well, right? 
that Saturday, uh, that he had told them to honor the Sabbath day, keep it home. Uh, then, watch this, they had throughout their whole calendar year, they have seven festivals. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We are not going to get through all seven. We're going to get through as many as the Lord allow us to get through tonight. Uh, and I'm going to explain to you what these festivals are and what they mean to us today. That's the whole point of reading any Old Testament scripture. You want to know how does this scripture relate to me today? And all scripture, we already just said earlier, all scripture relates to us today. All of it. We cannot get rid of any verses in the Bible. So, but we got to talk about these festivals first before we get into, we got to talk about Sabbath first before we get into the festival. So the feasts are important. Mm -hmm. They represent, watch this, all of these feasts, these festivals, they represent God's timetable. They represent the history of man. These feasts, and there are seven of them, uh, represent from the time Adam and Eve were created all the way until Jesus Christ come back. That's what these seven all represent. So it's really easy to follow um, the Jewish calendar. And these are all Jewish calendars, Jewish events that they, they do right now that they've been doing for 4,000 years, 5,000 years, ever since they came across the Red Sea. So they represent the history of mankind. These are not just mere holidays that they observed uh, just for holidays' sake, like when we have our holidays, most of our American holidays are really closer to the weekend, so we can have our barbecue. You know, that's why we have, that's why we have our holidays. Y'all notice that, don't you? They either all most of our holidays fall on it. Theirs don't. They have holidays that can go on for two weeks, the seven weeks straight, and we're going to talk about all of these festivals and holidays and how they represent God's timetable today. So Israel feasts were given to teach them this profound truth how to stay close to God. He gave them these seven feasts, these seven holidays, these seven festivals to teach them how to stay close to him. So if God gave that to them, guess what? He gave them to us, the church. So we're going to pull out these seven holidays for Jews to see how Jewish holidays help us today. Okay, let's do that. Number one about the step, we're going to again. So here's my point number one. What is the meaning of Sabbath? Somebody said it earlier. What is the meaning? You said, you said Saturday was the Sabbath day. Yeah, that's correct. But what is the meaning of Sabbath? Somebody said I heard it. Somebody said it. It's a day of rest. Rest. It's the day of rest. Sabbath means to rest. Now, the word Sabbath itself doesn't mean rest. It really means Sabbath. But, uh, but that is the day we call the day of rest. God called it because he created the world six days and rested on the seventh day or Sabbath day. So Sabbath really means seven. That's the number seven. That's how you say seven in Hebrew. Sabbath. But we call it rest because it was the day that God rested. Right? Right. Uh, so let's get started with Leviticus 23. That's the first three verses. I'm going to read from, just to let you know, when I read from the Old Testament, um, I read from different versions of the Bible called uh, paraphrase Bibles. And you can write these Bibles down. Some of you may have them. Uh, I really like them because they help us with our English today. The Living Bible is one Bible you can read from. So I know most of you had your King James Version. Now, the reason uh, I don't uh, read out of the King James Version because they do have a new King James Version. The reason I don't read out of the King James Version is because when you read out of the King James Version, it is 15th century English. That's how they talk 1,500 years ago. So you let me know if we talk like this. Whence comest thou? <laughs> Do we talk like that? I know it. No, you don't. No. That's all right. Romeo and Juliet, though. No, no, we don't talk like that today. So we need to talk and read material that really is close to the way we talk today. The New King James Version is that. So if you get a New King James Study Bible, that's a good Bible to get. I have the Bible that I use. A study Bible, because you know you have, you have some just other Bibles, but you should get a study Bible. This is the uh, John MacArthur Study Bible I have, which is I've been using for 20 years now. So this is an excellent book. There are many more good study Bibles out there, but the Living Bible is a good translation. It's not a study Bible; it's just a translation. Yes, yes. I see. 
Oh, I would just ask, what about the NIV study Bible? If that's what In, you're <laughs> there's a lot of questions about the NIV. <laughs> okay. I don't use the NIV because there's a couple of passages of scriptures that the NIV has changed. Okay. So, yes, uh, and that would be a study by itself. So mm -hmm. I don't rely on the NIV uh, study Bible. And which one that you say you have there? That's, uh, that's the John MacArthur okay. study Bible. Okay. The NIV has taken out passages of scriptures from the King James Version Bible. And the reason they have done that is because they said that it's not found in the original text. Mm -hmm. But uh, for them to do that, to me, they should not make that call mm -hmm. because for 1,500 years we have, we have had the King James Version mm -hmm. Bible. So for all these uh, thousands of years, people have been reading out the King James Version and for you to take that passage out because you say it's not relevant, mm -hmm. that's not their call to make. So the New King James Version Bible does not do that. They do not remove anything from the King James Bible. They don't do that. They just update the English for you. So the Living Bible, which is a really updated version, like 20th century version, the way we talk, is a good, uh, just a Bible to read. I'm thinking of another one. Uh, which one we use? Yes. How about the Holy Bible? Well, which one? Because the Holy Bible is back in the Holy Bible, Bible, but okay. the version okay. of it. Anybody got another different version of the Bible that you read? Amplified the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible yeah. is another Bible. Uh, Got to be careful with the Amplified Bible a little bit because the Amplified Bible you get a little confusing because this is what Amplified does. Amplified, when you try to read it, they have all of these up. Uh, Parenthesis yeah. and try to have you change the word to parenthesis. So when you're trying to read it, you kind of get lost in it. So I kind of stay away from uh, Bibles like that. Yes. Yeah, what about, um, I remember, was, ooh, I don't know, about 20, about 10 or 20 years ago, and, and when I was uh, really studying, like I uh, started out studying, and I, I picked up a, a parallel Bible because it had like four or five of them so you could. Mm -hmm. Piece them all yeah, together. There are, yeah, the Parallel Bible has four versions. They may have the NIV and then the King James, the New King James, the Living Bible. So those are good because you're looking at every version and you can see what they take out from the King James. You can see that right there from that Bible. That's a good Bible. They have uh, two parallel, you do King James, New King James. They got so many Bibles out there. But those three, I'm just mentioning the ones I like to hear. New, uh, John MacArthur Study Bible, uh, the Living Bible, uh, the Message Bible is pretty good. I don't know if you guys have ever heard message. of the Message Bible. Uh, the Message Bible was by Peterson. Peterson was a pastor for 25 years, and he retired, and he began to take all of his sermons and uh, go through the Bible and put that in current of the English of today. So that's another good study Bible to read from. Yes. The New King James is by John MacArthur, the one that you The study Bible. Is, yeah. You can get it, I think you can get John MacArthur the study Bible and King James, New King James. And I've always had yes. the King James Bible, study mm -hmm. Bible. I've always That's had a good that. One. That's a good I've study. always had that. And it, every time you read something from the New King James or um, the Living Bible, it has a, a, a number. You know, one, to, go to, yes. to go to it and it's right in the column. So, it, yeah. It's the same word that you use. Yes. And so instead of doing that, for yes, and so instead of uh, people have to go find those words, some translators just put it in their translation. See how you have to search for it? No, it, it's, it's, it's in it's your right. notes. It's right. right. It's right there next to the word. Right. right. And that's and good. Power. And that is a good study by the word. Oh, that's good. But what some Bibles have done, translators have done, they just took all that away and said, I'll just give it to you. So when you read it, you just read it right out. Instead of looking across to find the word that they're trying to change from the King James. So that's, that's pretty good. So I think those are pretty good. Any other Bibles? One more Bible. I think the New Living Translation. Oh, yeah. New Living. That's another one. That's a really popular study Bible. The living, not the new living, the living <laughs> That's another good popular Bible there. Right okay, so I'll be reading from the Living Bible, verse 1 through 3, Leviticus 23. And it says this, the Lord said to Moses, Announce 
to the people of Israel that they are to celebrate several annual festivals of the Lord, times when all Israel will assemble and worship me. Verse 3, these are in addition to your Sabbaths, the seventh day of every week, which are always days of rest. Always days of rest in every home, times for assembling to worship and for resting from the normal business of the week. So God set up these Sabbaths. Every Saturday, number one, was supposed to be a Sabbath. A day of what? Rest. 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 Right? Um, then God says, I'm going to create some holidays for you. And these shall be other Sabbaths, like weeks of Sabbaths, of days of rest. So on holidays, you're supposed to rest. That's what you, in other words, that's what you're supposed to say. So one, uh, when you talk about the seven-day week, uh, when we talk about resting on the Sabbath day, what that teaches us is that we should rest one day a week. We should be resting. But you know society, they want you to work 60, 80 hours a week. Right? That's Monday through Sunday. Some people work Monday through Sunday. But God said, no, you should be resting at least one day. One day you should have a day of rest from your work. Now, watch this. Some people thought, as I, when I was growing up, that that Sabbath day, once again, was Sunday. Right? So on Saturday night, they would tell us, you can't cook. You know, you know, so you got to do everything on Saturday instead of Sunday, right? Remember, not, remember the stores was closed. Remember yeah. that? Remember when they was open on Sunday? You couldn't drink on Sunday. Yeah. You know, you probably had to drink on Sunday. But yeah, you couldn't eat it on Sunday because the stores was closed. Y'all remember that? Gambling was closed. You couldn't do nothing on Sunday. They had the wrong perception. That's not what God is talking about when He say rest. He says rest from your work, rest from your job. Rest from your 40 hour week job. You need to rest. That's what he's going to run into that again. Uh, write this down. Genesis, I'm going to read it for you. Genesis 2, verse 2 and 3. This is from the New King James Version. And it says this So on the seventh day, having finished his task, God ceased from, his, from this work he had been doing. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he ceased this work of creation. So right there, the Sabbath day was established when God finished his work in six days and he rested. So he wants everybody else to do it. If God can rest, you can rest. That's right. You know what I'm saying? It's not that much world. You can rest. Take one day off and rest. Then God reinstated and renewed this Sabbath when he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Remember? So he, he established it in Genesis. He reestablished it with Moses in the Ten Commandments. Uh, write this down. I'm not going to read it. It's, called, it's from Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. That's where God reestablished the Sabbath day to Moses and said, I want you to give this to the children of Israel. They must rest on the Sabbath day. Then you have to take the day of rest. Of uh, the seventh day of business, you know, they believe that we should never get rid of the Sabbath, meaning we should uh, always go to church on Saturday. So if anybody knows anything about the seventh day of business or that teaching, why do the seventh day of business believe that we're wrong for going to church on Sunday and they're right for going to church on Saturday? Why do you think they believe that? Why haven't they changed with us? Why do they just start going to church on Sunday like we go to church on Sunday? Yes. Well, I have a girlfriend that's a Seventh Day Adventist, and she said it's because they believe in the Old Testament, what the Old Testament said, and the Old Testament said that the Saturday was the Sabbath, day, and that we is not living according to what the Word said. Ah, it's the Old Testament. Okay. Anybody else? You heard anything like that? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's basically yeah. what you're going to hear yeah. from the Seventh Day Adventist. Mm -hmm. uh, Anybody else? That we are not honoring the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But I read somewhere where Jesus said, if you got good study by me, you got good Google on your phone. Oh, look this up, look this passage of scripture. Jesus said, I am the Lord of Y'all yeah. remember that? He was baptizing, not baptized, he was teaching. Um, he went, disciples got hungry. On the Sabbath day, Jesus did what? 
he actually went into the field, plucked up the grain on the Sabbath day, and gave it to his disciples. Oh, 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 oh. Man, Jesus, you can't do that. It's the Sabbath day. So Jesus said this. He said, okay, so if you had a donkey that fell in the hole on the Sabbath day, are you going to wait till the next day to get them out? Or are you going to get them out? Because their, their mentality was, you can't work. Yeah. on the Sabbath day, but that wasn't the issue. The issue yeah. was you couldn't do your job on the Sabbath day. But if you needed to help somebody fix their car on Sunday, or let's say it's Saturday, it's the Sabbath day, you got a flat tire, well, no, I can't help you, brother, it's the Sabbath day. God told me not to do no work. <laughs> that don't make any sense. So somebody is hungry, no, I can't fix you any meal today. It's Saturday. I can't cook on Saturday. So I know you're going to starve to death about a couple more hours, but I, if you just hold on, just hold on five more hours every Sunday. You can't do that. God didn't That's say right. do that. He said you are to rest from your jobs, not rest from helping people. That's right. Not rest like Jesus. If somebody was hungry, you're supposed to feed them. I don't care what day it is. That's right. You're supposed to give them clothes. If somebody got hurt, you're supposed to be able to help them no matter mm -hmm. what day it is. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, Jesus talked about, remember the man uh, on Jericho Road? Uh, the, uh, the, I think it was a Jew on the, on the, uh, who was on the road who got some thieves caught him, right? Yeah. He got yeah. beat up. And and beat three him. people passed him by. Exactly. Yeah, right. He could Samaria. The preachers passed him by. It must have been the Sabbath day. You know, I can it. It had to be. Look, I'm going to church. I know But what did he say? A Samaritan stopped by and saw him. Not only did he help him, he wasn't even a Jew. He took him, put him on his horse, took him to the hotel, and said, put it on my table. Now, that was a Samaritan. He did that on the Sabbath day. But church folks, you know, we get caught up in our tradition, and we try to say, well, you know, I can't do anything because it's my tradition not to do it. Now, I'm going to throw one at you. Watch this. You're on your way to church. Somebody call you up real quick and say, listen, I, got, I need some money. My kids need a pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, if, and if I don't get these pair of shoes today, uh, look, they won't have any to go to school on Monday. Yeah. So listen, could you give me forty dollars? And all you got in your pocket is your tied money. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just messed you up now. <laughs> <laughs> you got your tied. You, this is Sunday. It's your tied money. Yeah. And they asked you for forty dollars, and that's all you got is your tied money. Yep. Yeah. You don't want to get it to him. You don't get it to him. You don't want to get it to him. No, I can take it to the church. No, I don't know. Jesus talked about this. Also, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he said, some of you try to use as an excuse that the reason you can't give to the church is because, or give your money or your tithes is because, uh, or no, you try to use the excuse that you can't take care of your parents. Right. Yeah. That you say that I need to take my money to take care of the church, and that's why I can't take care of give money to my parents to help them out. He said that's wrong. You can't do that. If somebody is in need, that's, that's where that right. money needs to go. That's right. That's right. That's if they in need, right? So we have to understand that. That's what he's talking about. Sabbath. Sabbath means rest from your work. Look at Colossians. So. Uh, go to the book of Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Now, I wonder did you know this was in the Bible. Because and while you're looking that up, let me go back to the Seventh-day Adventist. So okay. the Seventh-day Adventists say we are wrong. We're going to church on Sunday. We should be going to church on Saturday. Why, how can we refute that? What can we say to a Seventh-day Adventist who tells us that we're wrong and going to church on Sunday instead of Saturday? I would say, what would you tell I'm saying the day of Sabbath is any day you set aside to worship God. Yeah. Okay. So what's this? What did you set to sky? Any day you set aside to worship God. Oh. So, day of Sabbath. If you had to work on Sunday or Saturday, you can worship Him. So if they ask you, why do you go to church on Sunday? What would you tell them? Jesus got up. Amen. Oh, yeah. Amen. That's a good answer. Jesus got up on the third day. That's, yeah. the, that's the main reason why we go to church on Sunday. But Colossians says something different. Uh, the New Testament, remember, it actually puts together and shows you what the Old Testament is all about. Remember, they all go together. You cannot get rid of the Old Testament. 
So what we have to do is we have to make sure that the Old Testament matches the New Testament. Whatever interpretation you want to give, it has to match. So if a Seventh-day Adventist tell me I can't go to church on Sunday, then I have to go to Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Now it's going to mess up with their interpretation. It's going to mess this, this, These two verses are going to mess them up. Listen to this. So remember, keep that in mind. Uh, you're doing it wrong. You, you're not doing what God told you to do. This is what they tell you, right? The Old Testament says, honor the Lord, God of the Sabbath, day, and keep it home. Verse 16 says this in Colossians chapter 2. So don't let anyone criticize you for what you eat or drink. The Muslims say, I can't eat they said I can't do it. Leviticus, Leviticus 11 say, I, according to Jewish law, I can't eat ham. Can't eat pork. Can't eat pork. That's what it was. The diet of Leviticus 11 says. Now, if you guys want to go by the Old Testament, Jesus says, if you if you want to go by the Old Testament, that's fine. But you better go by all of them. If you miss one of them, you messed up all of them. That's right. You don't supposed to eat according to Leviticus 11. According to that diet, the Jews could not eat pork. They, they could not eat pork. Guess what else they couldn't eat? According to the list of Leviticus 11, they can't eat uh, anything that crawled on the bottom of the sea. Oh, that's the catfish. That's your shrimp. Yeah. Oh, scallops. Yeah. Oh, 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 this verse says, verse 16, so don't let anyone criticize you for what you eat or drink or, watch this, for what or not celebrating Jewish holidays and feasts or new moon ceremonies or what? Sabbaths. Verse 17, for these were, here's the reason, for these were only temporary rules that ended when who came? Christ came. They were only shadows of the real thing of Christ himself. So guess what the Old Testament point to? The Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They are types and shadows of who Jesus really is. And that's why I told you when we read the Old Testament, we're looking for Jesus in those chapters. Mm -hmm. we're, we're looking for the symbols. We're looking for well, how does that connect to what Jesus did? So that's what the Old Testament is used for. We do accept all the, the precepts of the Old Testament. We do accept all of the morals of the New Testament. But can't no Nobody connect you to any ritual because we don't kill pigs. I mean, we don't kill animals today to put the forgiveness of our sins anymore. Why? Jesus died on the cross. So that that whole system has been done away with after Jesus died on the cross. So do we get rid of the Ten Commandments? No, because they are moral laws as well. Just go through the Ten Commandments. Anyone? Except the uh, Sabbath day, the only reason we say the Sabbath day is because Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Yep. So you honor him when you accept Jesus as your Savior. So when anybody say, well, you guys don't honor the Sabbath day. Yes, we do. We honor him every day. Because we place Jesus in our life because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. But any other ten of the ten, the nine, you can follow it's not telling you anything that is a ritualistic form out of your father and thy mother that your days may be wrong, right? Don't kill. Don't steal. Uh, the first commandment. Uh, thou shalt not uh, take any graven image, right? right? You should not worship any other god but me. Oh, of course, we can keep that. So you got to look at the precepts and the moral precepts of the Old Testament. That's what we keep. But we do not keep rituals at all. So they told me, you know, you can't wear cotton. You know, they could mix cotton with his other material. They, they, there was a whole lot of material that they could not do uh, in the Jewish community. But that was just for them. Mm -hmm. But we were supposed to take those symbols and understand what they represented for us today. That's what we're doing right now. So any questions about that? So now you know what the Sabbath day is. So what does the Sabbath point to? We just read, write, write this down, Hebrews 4. I'm going to read it for you. Okay. Uh, Hebrews 4, verse 9 through 11. I'm going to read that. So what do the Sabbath? So I give you scripture to go with it. Okay. So there is a full, complete rest 
still waiting for the people of God. Verse 10, Christ has already entered there. He is resting from his work, just as God did after the creation. Did you hear what he just said? When Jesus died on the cross, the scripture says he went, chapter 10 of Hebrews, he went to the Holy of Holies and sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat there. And then after that, guess what he did? He sat down next to the Father. That's where Jesus is now. So, you know, when you hear people say they have dreams and visions that Jesus came to them, and uh, they saw Jesus in a pancake and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no. <laughs> Jesus is sitting on the right hand. So that's where he is right now. See, now, he, you said Jesus lives in me. His spirit lives in you, which is right. the Holy Spirit. Right. But yep. Jesus' actual glorified body is sitting on the right hand of the Father right now, making intercession for you and me. That's what he's doing. He, he's not coming back and forth, up and down, just to talk to you. He's not doing that. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that, too. So watch what he says. Jesus rested, sat down. Watch verse 11. Let us do our best to go into that place of rest, which is Jesus, too, being careful not to disobey God as the children of Israel did, thus failing to get in. This is what we have to understand. What do we rest in there? We rest in everything that Jesus did. So how do I rest in what Jesus did? So he said he took, a, to, he took away all my sins. Let me rest in that. Mm -hmm. I can't pay for my sins. I'm going to rest in what he said. He paid for my sins. Mm -hmm. So why in the world am I trying to say, if I just go to church, 52 weeks out of the year, I'm going to make it to heaven. <laughs> no, then I'm not resting in what he did. So I'm saying what he did at the cross wasn't good enough. If I just paid my tithes faithfully, I'm going to make it in. Then you rested in your work instead of what he did at the cross. There's actually nothing that you could do other than rest in Jesus to get into heaven. Nothing. What is it that you're going to do to get yourself into heaven other than resting in what Jesus did? Because he's the one that died, right? And he's the one that shed his blood. So there's nothing else for you to do. So watch this. You say, so why am I working? Why do I go to church then? You're appreciating God for what he already did for me. I'm not trying to get to heaven. Because I know I'm already going to heaven. So I'm just appreciating God. Lord, thank you. I'm going to give you my body. I'm going to give you my mouth. I'm going to give you my mind. I'm going to use this body to tell you thank you for letting me in your, your heaven because your son died on the cross for my sin. And I said, I believe that. I have faith in that. So uh, a lot of ministries, and here's, here's a way you can separate false preachers and false teachers and false ministries. Anybody that tried to add anything to what Jesus Christ did at that cross is wrong. That's right. Amen. Anybody that adds to what Christ, so in other in words, if we can't stop at the cross and say that was enough, now think about what that is. He came down from heaven, gave his body, shed his blood for you, right? And then, not only did he do that, he died. Then he got up on the third day. Now you mean to tell me that wasn't enough? So when people tell me today, well, no, 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 Reverend, you're not saved until you speak in tongues, Reverend. Oh, really? So you really tell me he died. And I didn't hear him say that on the cross. I never heard Jesus speak in tongues on the cross. Right. right? As a matter of fact, it was two thieves on both sides of him, right? Right. And I said, Jesus, if you if you be the son of God, you get get us off this cross and save us and yourself. The other guy said, You need to be quiet. We belong up here. He don't belong here. And, and he says, and Jesus looked at him, he said, Jesus, when you just Jesus says, listen, today you shall be with me at paradise. I didn't know what they spoke of. Well, you got to speak your tongues first. I never heard that. Jesus never said that, right? So anybody that add anything to the cross is wrong. Let me give you a couple of groups. Jehovah's Witnesses. They take the world's translation Bible, which is their translation of the Bible, and they also change scripture. So they're adding to 
the cross, meaning they're telling you that what he did at the cross wasn't good enough anyway, mm -hmm. that uh, you do have to work your way into heaven. That's what the Jehovah Witnesses mm -hmm. do. And if you didn't know it, and you watch the Jehovah Witnesses as they go out and witness, they out there in the rain, sleet, snow, 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 snow. right? They out yeah. there. They used to, oh, look how dedicated the Jehovah Witnesses <laughs> are. I mean, I wish, I wish Christians were that dedicated. But their, watch this, their motive for being out there all four seasons <laughs> is not the right motive. This is what they're told. If you don't get so many people into this church, you ain't going to make it in. <laughs> Your interest into the kingdom of heaven is based on how many people you win to Christ. Wow. That's what they're told. But watch this. Okay. They tell us only 144,000 go to heaven. That's right. Uh, it's 7 million Jehovah Witnesses in <laughs> So half of them, most of them ain't going to make it. 7 million. So God can pick, okay, I guess who, who, saw, who won the most souls? I guess 144,000. See, that, we don't have that kind of work-based religion. We don't. We say you can't work your way to heaven at all. We say that you only go to heaven by your faith in what Jesus Christ does. So let's go back to the tongue talkers. So I run to some tongue talkers, and they tell me that I'm not going to heaven because... Uh, I don't speak in tongues. That's your apostolic churches. Mm -hmm. A greater grace is an apostolic church. Mm -hmm. Yep, beautiful church, right? Beautiful. Yep. Yep. But yeah, they believe if you don't speak in tongues, you ain't gonna make it in. Pentecostal churches are uh, churches that teach uh, that you need to speak in tongues. Now, some of them won't go, won't be as dogmatic and say you won't make it in, but they will say this. All of them say this. If you don't speak in tongues, you don't have all of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Reverend, now, when you gave Jesus your heart, that was 10% of the Holy Ghost you got. But see, when you start speaking in tongues, you really don't have all of the Holy Ghost. I said, really? So when Jimmy Swaggart in 1987, who, who spoke in tongues more than you all, uh, stood up and said he was caught with a couple of prostitutes, what was his deal? <laughs> but he was speaking in tongues. I thought it so I, I got 10% of the Holy Ghost. He had a hundred percent. I would think that his lifestyle would be more different than mine. Yeah, that's right. If he had all of the Holy Ghost and I only had 10%. So that didn't fly with me with the 10% stuff. So and it don't go with the scriptures because now when you're telling me that my salvation is not good enough. Or Jesus, what he did at the cross wasn't good enough because now another work I got to do to get to heaven. Mm -hmm. I thought I got to heaven because of what he did, not what I did. So you got to remember that. So you got to what? Rest in Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus said this, write this down, Matthew 6, 25 through 33. He's talking about resting. 25 through 33. I'm going to read it for you. You write it down. So my counsel is... Don't worry about things, food, drink, or clothing. For so you already have life in a body, and they are far more important than what you eat and wear. See, people, you know, they, cook, they still stuff on what they eat and wear. Look at verse 26. Look at the birds. They don't worry about what to eat. They don't need to sow or reap or store up food for your Heavenly Father feeds them, right? And you are far more valuable to them than to him than they are. Verse 27, will all your worries add a single moment to your life? No. And why worry about your clothes? Look at the, the field lilies. They don't worry about theirs. Verse 29, yet King Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as beautifully as they. Verse 30, and if God cares so so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he more surely care for you, yes. old men, a little thing? Yes. Right? Verse 31, 32, so don't worry at all about having enough food and clothing. Why be like the heathens? But they take pride in all these things and are deeply concerned about them. But your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well that you need them. Verse 33, and he will give them to you if you give him, here's the key, first place in your life and live as he wants you to do. So you got to rest in Jesus Christ. you got to rest in what he, he has done and all these things will be added unto you. So now, let's go to what time is it? What time is it? Okay, 715. Any questions so far? Because we're going to get to the first festival. You're going to love this one. The first festival.
first festival. The first festival, write it down, is the Passover. So this is the first thing on the Jewish calendar. The Jewish calendar doesn't start in January. The Jewish calendar starts with April. Okay, just remember that. It always, they, their New Year starts at the end. This is festival or holiday number one. You want to call it a holiday? Let's call it holiday number one. It's the Passover. This is a spring holiday, right? Because this is April, April time, which is the beginning of the Jewish year, God's calendar. So in Leviticus, let's find it in Leviticus 23, verse 4 and 5. Let's go to Leviticus 23, verse 4 and 5. So God created this festival for them, this holiday. He said this. These are the holy festivals, verse 4. These are the holy festivals which are to be observed each year. Now, verse 5. The Passover of the Lord. This is the number one. This is to be celebrated on the first day of April, beginning at sundown. Now, the Passover, what is that? Where did the Passover start? And where did the Passover come from? Oh, what did I say? The first day? Oh, the 14th day. Yes. The first month of the, the 14th day of the, the first month, first month, but the 14th day of the first month. Right? Uh, they call it Nisan, I think. So that's the 14th day of the first month. Thank you. Uh, so what is the Passover all about? What is that? Yes. It's when um, the death angel passed yeah, over. It's when the death angel passed over in Goshen. Yes. Is that correct? Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Not just Goshen. The death angel passed over where? Everyone. All of Egypt. Yeah. Right? He went through all of Egypt. He passed over only a few houses right. in Egypt. Yeah. So Goshen is a city in, in Egypt. But he went through all of Egypt. Okay, so anybody know the reason why did he come? Why, why did he do that? Why did the death angel come in the first place? What was the reason? Why did he show up? So the last curse uh, that God put on Egypt was the death of the firstborn. The firstborn of animals and the firstborn of males. Right? So that's what Moses uh, told the uh, Pharaoh, said, listen, if you don't let God's people go, this is it. And then uh, he said, you'll never see me again. And then Mo, uh, Pharaoh said, if I see you again, I'm going to kill you. He said, well, I ain't got to worry about that. So, because uh, <laughs> I ain't going to see you. <laughs> so, why is that? So, this, it was amazing to me, the night before that all of this happened, God told the Israelites to do what? He said, take the lamb. Uh -huh. Take the lamb. I want you to cut the lamb, get your family together, act like you guys set up a meal that you're about to go to flight, that you're going to leave. And I want you to take that lamb, I want you to take it, put the, dip the blood in hyssop, and I want you to mark your doorposts. Right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So isn't that something that when the angel came that night, yes. when the angel came, he went to every house. Mm -hmm. yep. But when he saw the house that had the blood on the door, he passed over. That's why we call it. Passover. So the house that didn't have the blood on it, he they went died. in and killed the first one. Yeah. Mm. That's what he did. Now, yeah. isn't that something? Now, mm. we love that story, but once again, yeah. when you read Old Testament scripture, you got to do what? Find Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we connect that to Jesus Christ? Well, uh, didn't Jesus shed his blood yes, on some wood? Mm -hmm. On the door, we call the door post, on yeah. the cross yeah. beams, yeah. on the yeah. Roman cross. Yes. And watch this. Anybody hid behind that doorpost, those beams, guess what? You are saved. Mm -hmm. You won't die. Yep. Anybody, put, that's why I said your works have nothing to do with it. Anybody that's hid behind Jesus mm -hmm. and what he did at the cross mm -hmm. in faith, you are saved. Mm -hmm. Now you know you have some knuckleheads in those houses. You already know. <laughs> <laughs> you already know you are messed up in the, don't that everybody got one in the family? But Jesus, if that blood was covered, it was covered. Okay. So crazy Uncle Johnny, he was saved because he was hid behind him. And so guess what? Because you hid behind the blood of Jesus, your sins can't even stop you. Because your sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's something we really got to understand, that we can't save ourselves. So can anybody live perfectly on this planet? You mean to tell me after y'all met Jesus, y'all still sin after you met Jesus? Oh, 
the festival of unleavened bread. This is to be celebrated beginning the day following the Passover. And for seven days, and for that seven, again, you must not eat any bread made with yeast. Verse 7, on the first day of this festival, you shall gather the people for worship, and all ordinary work shall cease. Verse 8, you shall do the same on the seventh day of the festival. On each of the intervening days, you shall make an offering by fire to the Lord. So this, this holiday called the unleavened bread, what did that represent for the Jewish people first? That we're going to talk about what it represents for us today. Well, they had to make bread in a hurry when they left uh, Egypt. So they didn't have the uh, ingredients and stuff. So they didn't put the yeast. What does yeast do? They made the bread by fire. So, also, yeast represents something uh, in the Old Testament. What did it represent? Sin. Sin. It represents sin in the Old Testament. That's another reason why he said, do not. Now, all those who, if you're giving your offering, uh, still write your name down if you're giving offering for your book as well. Because I need those names as well to let me know how many books to order. You got the list? Okay, you got the list. Yes. What, what was the Bible passage for the left? Uh, Leviticus 23, verse 6 through 8. Leviticus 23, verse 6 through 8. So it represents sin, yeast. So watch this. When God was telling them to hurry up and get out of Egypt, he's telling them, leave those sins behind. Leave all that stuff behind. Leave the world behind. So the yeast taken out of the bread, the unleavened bread, represents what? you got to leave the world behind. So that, that's what it means for us today. It means for us that we, watch this, Luke 12 and 1, write this down. This is what Jesus said. He said, be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But that's what Jesus said. He said, stay away from the yeast of, because, you know, yeast causes the dough to rise, and it spreads out. So what if, what if one part of the bread is affected, the whole loaf was going to be affected, right? So he said, stay away. As Christians, we should stay away from sin as well. You know, uh, Romans chapter 12, read that chapter. You know, present your body to live sacrifice. Yeah. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So it didn't say that you will be perfect after you get Jesus. Mm -hmm. It says you stay away from sin. Another good chapter mm -hmm. to read about you staying away from sin is Romans chapter 6. It didn't say God is going to come down, open up your mind, and pour into <laughs> you perfection. It says in chapter 6 of Romans, you mortify the deeds of God. Your body. You present. You got not going to force you. He's not going to make you. He's not because if God's going to make us do something, He would make all of us do. That's right. Right. So you know when people shout on Sunday, I love when people shout on Sunday because people say they used to sound. They still say it. nowadays. They say the Holy Ghost. Me. I caught the Holy Ghost, right? <laughs> and, no, I just couldn't help it. I just had to get up and shout. Okay, that's fine. So you mean to tell me that the Holy Spirit made you, because you can't help it now. The Holy Spirit got a hold of you. You heard the music going and everything, and so you started dancing because you couldn't stop yourself. You was forced by the Holy Ghost to do that. But when you left church, you cussed the lady out down the street. So the Holy Ghost made you dance, but he didn't make you stop. He can make you say, oh, you should thank you, Jesus, but he can't make you love your neighbor. Come on, that, that don't make sense to me. If God will make me do something, he will make me live right. If he made me do anything, but he don't make anybody do anything. You've got to surrender everything over to him on your own. And if you don't do it, that's the test right there to let us know that you're really not dedicated to what he wants you to do. You're dedicated to what you want to do. We're going to stop right there. We'll write this down. First Corinthians 5, 6, and 8. We're going to start with that next week.